Great, well, hi everyone, and thanks for that introduction, Katie. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here with folks. Um, so you should be able to see that now. So great, so the presentation today is about nitrogen management with uh, cover crops. And I think a lot of us, because we live in Pennsylvania and there's a lot of cover cropping in Pennsylvania, we're all fairly familiar with the importance um, and the role that cover crops play um, as a, a key nutrient management strategy. So um, they can be effective at uh, reducing nitrate leaching over the winter and help protect water quality. They help to um, increase soil health and soil aggregation and improve infiltration rates, reduce runoff with erosion. So there's a lot of benefits and um, we're really lucky to live in a state where we've got um, a farming community and an agricultural industry that's very supportive and, and promoting of, of cover crops. So some colleagues of mine did an analysis of um, data from the USDA on uh, cover crop implementation. And um, you can see on the East Coast, we've got higher levels of, of implementation and, and Pennsylvania is one of the highest uh, states in the nation for implementation of cover crops. Um, this is a kind of annual uh, percentage of, of cropland. Um, Pennsylvania is at about 16% um, of, of annual cropland. So that would be all acres of annuals, corn, soybeans, wheat, whatnot. But we've also done some additional analyses where we've looked at just um, cover cropping after uh, say corn silage acres in the southeastern part of the state like Berks, Lancaster, Lebanon County and seeing that in those areas, um, you know, 52 to 75% of acres um, are getting cover cropped in those partic particular geographies and, and rotation windows. So um, this is uh, a really prevalent um, part of crop rotations and something that we need to be uh, aware of how to manage these the best we can, both for, you know, getting the benefits of uh, protecting water quality for, um, and preventing leaching and, and soil erosion, but also trying to understand when we start integrating cover crops into our uh, systems, how do we then manage uh, overall soil fertility in um, subsequent crops uh, later in the rotation? And how do we um, best integrate these with manure applications and, and things like that? So that's kind of the purpose of this webinar today is to try and develop a, a deeper understanding of um, how, uh, nitrogen management changes with cover crops and how to use cover crops wisely and to the uh, best best of our um, advantage. So uh, thinking about some of the 4R concepts and how those relate to cover crops, um, some of our 4R goals uh, for cover cropping include um, trying to use cover crops to prevent nitrogen leaching um, when you can't manage uh, manure with the right timing. Um, so for example, fall manure applications. Um, typically we would not say putting manure on in the fall for a summer crop the next year, that's not really the right timing in terms of the 4R principles. Um, but that happens because of limitations of manure storages and, and things like that. We sometimes need to spread manure in the fall. So you can use cover crops as a tool to help overcome um, problems when we don't have the right timing. Um, preventing nitrate leaching also is important if the previous crop um, maybe didn't yield what we expected it would, and there's nitrogen fertilizer that was put out for that crop that wasn't fully utilized, we can recover some of that nitrogen with, with cover crops. So one of the other things we wanna think about is how does the cover crop that we've chosen to put into our system, how does that affect the fertilizer requirement for nitrogen of the following crops? Um, and so how do we adjust the right rate of nitrogen fertilizer considering what our cover crop was? So we're gonna talk about that. Um, we're also going to talk about how to use some tools that might help you um, create a variable rate nitrogen prescription uh, in a field based on um, factors of the cover crop and the soil and the crop yield potential, um, create a variable rate prescription that would help you put the right amount of nitrogen in the right place um, in the field. And then we also want to think about the right form or, or right source in terms of for our principles, how this relates to cover crops is choosing the right species of cover crop, the right type of cover crop that helps best uh, meet your overall management goals 
on the farm so that you're um, effectively utilizing those cover crops to achieve what you want to. So these are some of the four R concepts that I'm gonna try and highlight today in the presentation. Okay, so let's talk about some basic concepts of cover crops and um, how they acquire nitrogen from the soil. We've kind of got two broad categories of, of cover crop species. Um, we've got grasses and brassicas, which are non-legume cover crop species, and they, uh, the only way that they can get nitrogen to fuel their growth is to take nitrogen up out of the soil. And um, species like brassicas and, and rye um, or other grasses like triticale or wheat um, can be very effective scavengers of nitrogen that's left in the soil in the profile at the end of the growing season. So the other broad category of cover crops are legumes. And legumes are a, a, a family of, of plants that um, can fix their own nitrogen from the atmosphere. They do this um, through uh, their root nodules in living inside these nodules or bacteria that um, take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and convert it into a form that the plant can use. And so um, this is a, a fundamentally different way of acquiring nitrogen from the environment uh, for these legume crops. And that has implications for um, how good they are at reducing nitrate leaching and how much nitrogen they can recycle to the next crop. So we also have um, different growth periods of cover crops and um, we can categorize these as winter hardy species that when planted in the fall will survive through the winter and continue growing in the spring, produce more biomass in the spring. So for example, cereal rye and uh, canola would be examples of winter hardy species. Um, also, uh, you know, triticale, wheat, annual ryegrass would be winter hardy. Um, uh, several of our legumes like red clover would be winter hardy. Um, and then we have some species that are maybe sort of on the edge. It depends a lot on the season, but maybe crimson clover, depending on how things go, or hairy vetch, depending on how things go, might be um, winter hardy as well. And then we have species that generally um, nine times out of 10 will reliably winter kill in our climates. And those, these are things like um, oats uh, pictured here or forage radish. Typically the winters are cold enough to um, terminate these crops and then their residues start to die and um, decompose over the winter time. And so those certainly have implications for um, uh, nitrogen uptake, whether that continues into the spring, as well as when that nitrogen is released and made available uh, to the next crop. So we wanna have these different characteristics of species in mind, their legume versus non-legume and winter kill versus winter hardy as we evaluate their performance at uh, different objectives in our, our cropping system. So let's look at um, one of the uh, primary benefits of cover crops and one of the reasons that they're most often grown is to help prevent nitrate leaching um, over the winter time. Uh, this is some data from an experiment uh, that we did at our research uh, station, Rock Springs in Center County. Um, and we grew uh, different cover crops. Um, uh, these cover crops were actually uh, planted after um, wheat harvest. So in our region in, in uh, Center County, Pennsylvania, it's cold enough that a lot of these different um, species won't uh, establish well grown after corn or grown after soybeans. We need to plant them by late August. And so really the only window we have is after wheat. But what we did is um, we measured nitrate leaching and how much nitrate moved below 12 inches um, during the growth period of these different cover crops. And that's what's on the y-axis here is pounds of nitrogen lost um, into the subsoil. And we would consider if it moved below 12 inches during the winter time, it's in a more vulnerable um, state to be lost uh, for leaching. It doesn't necessarily mean it's definitely gonna be leached, but it's sort of on its direction towards leaching out of the system. So we saw uh, without a cover crop, almost 100 pounds of nitrogen uh, leached uh, per acre. And then as we move into different species, nitrate leaching goes down. So let's talk about some of these species and, and their effect at reducing nitrate leaching. So um, the clover cover crop here, this was a red clover cover crop, um, was fairly slow growing and it's also a legume. So it fixes its own nitrogen from the atmosphere. So we didn't see um, that strong of a reduction in leaching when we grew the clover in monoculture. 
Now, when we grew um, a series of, uh, or the next ones that were sort of moderately effective at reducing leaching uh, was an Austrian winter pea, oats, and radish. And uh, the pea is a legume, but it's a fairly fast growing legume in the fall. And so even though it can fix its own nitrogen, it um, still uh, will put a, a demand on the soil nitrogen to some extent and help reduce that leaching. So in the fall, this is a picture of what the Austrian winter pea biomass looks like going into winter versus the red clover biomass. You can see there's a lot more biomass of the, of the pea there. Um, but the other species that we have here are non-legumes, the oat and the radish. Those are very um, good nitrogen scavengers, but they winter kill. And so some of the nitrogen that they take up is released back again in the spring and might move below 12 inches um, as well as uh, nitrogen that might mineralize in the spring from soil organic matter, those crops aren't continuing to grow in the spring and, and scavenge that nitrogen. So um, the winter killed species are not quite as effective um, at reducing nitrate leaching. And then we have a series of um, cover crops here that are um, different mixtures um, of, of cover crop species, um, as well as some monocultures. And these were all highly effective at um, uh, reducing nitrate leaching um, compared to the fallow. And our best performer was the rye monoculture here. But some of these other mixes here only had say a 20% seeding rate of rye, this three species N mix here, that was a mix of um, rye, um, uh, pea and clover. And just the 20% seeding rate of rye basically gave us almost 90% of the benefit um, that the rye monoculture did. Um, canola was a, a good scavenger. Here we've got a, a six species mix that was actually all of our monocultures mixed together, but it had a seeding rate of 20% rye, 25% canola. These are seeding rates compared to the monoculture of that species. So if we say, see, if we seeded rye at 100 pounds per acre, then a 20% seeding rate would be 20 pounds per acre of rye in the mix. Um, here again, generally tends to be as we increase the percentage of the um, uh, non-legumes in the mixture, leaching goes, gets better and better and better, but not that much better than just a 20% seeding rate. And so um, that's an important uh, conclusion to realize when we're using mixtures that we don't need a huge seeding rate of, of a non-legume in a mix to achieve the majority of the benefit of, of nitrate leaching reduction. So what I want to talk about now is I'm using uh, a cereal rye cover crop um, planted in the fall paired with fall manure applications and how that combination of fall manure and cover crops um, changes the dynamics of, of nitrogen uh, loss and nitrogen leaching over the winter, as well as nitrogen supply to the following uh, corn crop in terms of what the cover crop might recycle um, uh, back to the corn crop for that manure. So what we did here is we set up an experiment um, where uh, we planted rye cover crops in early October. And one of the things that we found um, in our research is that it's really important to prioritize planting the cover crop in the fall. So if you've, so this experiment, we harvested corn silage. And then, you know, if you're thinking about what's the next thing to do after corn silage, should I spread manure first or should I plant my cover crop first? What we found is that generally you have um, better environmental and agronomic outcomes if you prioritize planting the cover crop as soon as you can, because that cover crop is um, limited in its growth potential. And every day in the fall that you wait to plant that cover crop, you're losing out on, on potential growth. So we planted the cover crop first. And then about a month later, we came back in early November and we broadcast manure over the top uh, of that cover crop. Um, and we had a 6,800 gallon per acre application rate. And based on the manure analysis, that supplied 68 pounds per acre of ammonium N and 104 pounds per acre of organic N. So then what we did is we came back in the springtime. And so, okay, so the design of this experiment, let me back up a little bit. We had um, with and without rye crossed with with and without manure applied. So there's, there's kind of four treatments um, in this experiment that, that we're gonna be comparing. Uh, after the winter, we came back um, on April 29th, um, which was right before the cover crop was planned to be terminated and uh, planting corn. 
At that point, we wanted to look at how much nitrate was in the soil profile um, to evaluate potential for losses um, of nitrate over the winter, you know, where that nitrogen might have moved um, during the winter, given our manuring history and our cover cropping practices and, and those. Um, so this figure shows um, the soil nitrate level. So no, soil nitrate will actually be um, across here. So these are parts per million of soil nitrate uh, measured on April 29th. And then we've got different depth segments. So we, we took our core and we split that up into four depth, depth segments um, going deeper into the soil. So this is our last depth segment was from 60 to 80 centimeters. Um, that's about two feet, uh, uh, two, almost three feet deep um, into the soil there. And then uh, the different lines here indicate at each level of soil depth, what was our, our nitrate level. And so um, what we see is that generally, uh, nitrate increased as we were getting deeper. But if we look at um, uh, comparisons between our different treatments, what we saw is that applying manure in the fall without growing a cover crop across all of the different soil profile layers, we had increased um, nitrate levels. And so that shows you the potential um, risk for uh, uh, nitrate losses over the winter. Um, when we had either no manure applied or where we had um, manure with a cover crop or a cover crop growing without manure, those three other treatments were all uniformly lower in soil nitrate than, than the fall manure. So this shows you kind of the vulnerability of that, that fall manure application. Now, um, one of the interesting things is when we look at the gray line here and the orange line here, this is a cover crop with either manure or uh, with either manure applied or no manure applied. And so regardless of whether we applied manure or not, the cover crop was just as effective at reducing soil uh, nitrate. So that's a good thing because sometimes um, we worry that maybe the cover crop won't be able to soak up all of the nitrogen that uh, is applied by, by, the, uh, by the manure. But with this application rate um, here and this level of, of ammonium and organic and applied um, the cover crop was able to effectively scavenge that nitrogen down to the same level as um, where we had no manure applied at all. And then the last take home from this data is that um, the cover crop effect reduced soil nitrate at the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer. Um, the cover crop effect uh, reduced soil nitrate levels, but it didn't um, reduce nitrate levels at the lowest level, the 60 to 80 centimeter, the cover crop effect um, kind of didn't reach that that far down. And, um, you know, that's probably because the cover crop root system um, did not have enough time to get down there and and scavenge that that nitrate um, by the time it was killed. So, it's, but it's being very effective down to um, 60, at least 60 centimeters, which is about two feet deep. So uh, this is what the cover crop biomass looked like in the spring. Um, here we have uh, cover crops growing after manure versus cover crops growing after no manure. And so you can see um, the cover crops that got manure in the fall are thicker, they're greener, they're taller. And when we analyzed the amount of nitrogen that was in that cover crop biomass, uh, we saw that where we applied manure, there was um, about 30 pounds more nitrogen in that cover crop biomass than where we didn't apply manure. And so that cover crop's getting that 30 pounds of nitrogen from, from the fall manure. We also looked at the carbon to nitrogen ratio of these two um, cover crops, and they were actually uh, both exactly the same at a C to N ratio of 17. And the carbon to nitrogen ratio is um, an important indicator of how much nitrogen will be released into uh, and made available to the future crop during mineralization. I'll talk about that a little bit later in, in the presentation here. So what we saw in terms of the cover crop um, reducing soil profile nitrate fairly effectively, um, we've done a lot of on-farm sampling this spring. Um, and this is a, a graduate student and an employee at the Agricultural and Local Services Lab, Sarah Tierney here, um, extracting uh, deep soil cores on some of the farms that we've worked on this spring. And um, four different farms that we looked at that had different cover crop management practices, whether that was uh, ryegrass crimson, crimson clover blend, or uh, a rye, uh, rye cover crop down here, or a wheat cover crop here. When we looked at soil 
uh, nitrate in the profile, and this time we only went down to 60 centimeters, we saw that uniformly it was uh, quite low. So uh, one part per million nitrate or lower throughout the whole soil profile. And if you look at these cover crops, these are very um, large cover crops. The farms we worked on are, are really big into the, um, the idea of high biomass cover crops, planting green uh, into these cover crops, um, letting them grow big. So, uh, you know, their root systems are really scavenging all of that nitrate. And in comparison uh, to a, fat, a farm with, that wasn't growing a cover crop, what we saw were soil nitrate levels in the eight to four part per million range. So you can see there's a, a big difference and a big effect of, of cover crops reducing um, nitrate in the soil profile uh, in the springtime. So they're very, they can be very effective, especially when you let them grow this tall. Now the challenge and the big thing that you need to be aware of when you integrate these cover crops into the system is that they do do a great job at drawing down um, the soil profile nitrate levels over the winter time and into the springtime. But that creates a challenge that you really need to be aware of when you then rotate into the next crop, especially if it's corn, um, which is a, a heavy nitrogen feeder. And so these are pictures um, from some plots uh, that we had at, at the uh, Rock Springs Research Farm this spring. And we grew uh, cover crops with different um, levels of biomass. We killed them when they were early, when they were kind of medium in maturity, when they were very mature. And then we had a fallow strip in between here. And um, this was right before we uh, side dressed nitrogen on this corn. All of the corn received 25 pounds of uh, nitrogen per acre at planting. But you can see almost to a line where the cover crop was grown, we've got a reduction in, in growth and greenness of that corn um, compared to where we had the fallow. And that, uh, that phenomenon is what we call preemptive competition for nitrogen, that the cover crops in the springtime will preemptively compete and draw down the soil profile nitrate. And so that soil profile uh, that I showed you there of nitrate in, in late April, by that point in time, that nitrogen is at very low risk of leaching because the soils are starting to dry down, the crops are gonna be planted. But having our soil profile nitrogen drawn down to that extreme level basically sets us back uh, in, in, in time and availability of nitrogen. And so um, you can see that big difference here where this corn, um, even though it receives some starter nitrogen growing on the cover crop compared to where we had no cover crop, is definitely set back in, in growth. And so um, this possibly is going to need some additional nitrogen uh, applied to it to help it catch up um, and, and achieve the yield. Um, so we would wanna think about at the side dressing time, side dressing some additional nitrogen here to make, uh, make up for what the cover crop scavenged in the springtime. So, um, when we looked at the uh, experiment um, I showed you with the manure and the fall cover crop, these are our four treatments here, manure with the cover crop, manure with no cover, uh, no manure with cover, and no manure with no cover. We grew corn after those plots, and we used our um, recommendation system in the agronomy guide uh, that credits nitrogen from manure and helps develop a nitrogen recommendation for how much supplemental fertilizer you need. Um, the types of calculations you do in a, a nutrient balance sheet or a, a nutrient management plan. Uh, we thought we, were, we could get about 150 bushel corn at this site based on previous history. So that's kind of our total available N that we were shooting for. Now, based on agronomy guide availability factors, when we had manure applied in the fall with the cover crop, theoretically we should be getting more nitrogen from that manure made available. So the, the calculations based on availability of ammonium nitrogen and organic N, theoretically we should have 71 pounds of available nitrogen in that manure when we have the cover crop. When we don't have the cover crop, we assume that some of that nitrogen will be lost to leaching over the winter, and we only credit the manure with 36 pounds of nitrogen. So then to get to our final goal of about 150 pounds nitrogen, how much fertilizer nitrogen do we then need? So in the manure with cover crop treatment, we only applied 77 pounds of fertilizer nitrogen Manure without the cover crop, we applied 113 pounds. And where we didn't have the um, cover crop planted, or excuse me, where we didn't have manure, we applied 150 pounds of, uh, of nitrogen to meet our, our yield goal of 150 bushel per acre. 
So when we looked at the, so what I want you to focus on is how much fertilizer did we apply to the different treatments here. Um, and when we looked at corn yields here, we saw that where we um, had manure and the cover crop growing and reduced the fertilizer, assuming we would get that nitrogen back from the uh, cover crop, um, we saw a yield decline here um, in that treatment. So the yield was only about 135 bushel per acre, whereas we were getting in the uh, 160s and even up to 180. These were not statistically different from each other, um, these three, but they were greater than um, uh, what we achieved with the manure um, and cover crop here. So uh, to me, this um, gives me a little bit of concern that are we, you know, appropriately crediting the uh, cover crop in terms of, you know, actually releasing that nitrogen that it, it scavenges. And um, there's a lot of different factors that go into that nitrogen release. And I think um, we need to um, kind of increase our awareness, increase our ability to either credit or not credit that nitrogen from the cover crop so that we supply enough nitrogen to the corn and, and don't have a, a yield loss. So uh, we can also look at other experiences from a different experiment. This is the experiment um, I showed you where we had different termination timings of, of the rye cover crop. So we had an early termination timing and a late termination timing of rye, and we had the no cover crop treatment. And um, when we uh, applied different rates of nitrogen to that corn and looked at the yield response, we can calculate what we call the economic optimum nitrogen rate. And so this is the rate of nitrogen that is most profitable for corn production. Um, it may not maximize the yield, but at this point, adding more nitrogen, the yield response is so slim that it's not economical to add more nitrogen. But what we saw is that um, in the no cover crop treatment, our economic optimum nitrogen rate was 88 pounds of N, but where we had the rye cover crop growing, it went up to 113 pounds of N required and 111 pounds of N required. So these cover crops took up 25 pounds of N or 40 pounds of N from the soil. They had C to N ratios that are starting to get a little bit high and may not release that nitrogen back immediately. And so this is just another um, example of the need to increase nitrogen fertilizer after uh, a cereal cover crop like this. Now, if you notice the yields that we were getting in this experiment, we we're getting in the 180s and 190s, um, of, of corn yield, and we're only needing to put out 88 or 113 pounds of nitrogen. And so that's important because under our current recommendation system, you know, if you thought you could get 190 bushel corn, you'd be targeting 190 pounds of, of available N uh, to put out. But the reality is we can get by, a lot of times we can get by with less. And even under the cover crop scenarios, if we had followed our uh, traditional nitrogen recommendations, we would have been safe. We would have been putting out you know, 180, 190 pounds of nitrogen. We actually would have been well above that. So there's still an opportunity for us to um, potentially reduce our rates from what our current recommendation system says to do when we're cover cropping and when we've built up high soil organic matter levels. So this site had 3.1% uh, uh, organic matter. Kind of the state average is about 2.7% organic matter. So um, that organic matter is going to mineralize nitrogen and, and make that available to the next crop. So if we think about our, our current nitrogen fertilizer recommendation system that we're using in, in Pennsylvania, um, that recommendation system was based on a series of experiments where they, at different sites, where they grew corn at different nitrogen rates and looked for that economic optimum nitrogen rate. And that's what for each experiment, each of these bars is an experiment where they determine that economic optimum nitrogen rate. And we've taken the, the yields here um, that were achieved at the site at that economic optimum nitrogen rate and sorted them from low to high. And our recommendation system was developed based on this data set in order to bracket the high end of what the um, optimum nitrogen rate was. So for example, up to 130 bushel per acre corn, uh, we recommend 130 pounds nitrogen per acre, and that is 95% um, of the time enough or more than enough nitrogen. But when it's more than enough, what is the opportunity to potentially reduce that to be more economical and be more environmentally friendly with our, our rate, right? Get the right rate. If we could figure out how to predict that, um, we'd be in uh, 
you know, we advance our, our management and economics and environmental stewardship. Um, as the yields increased, um, we tend to see slightly more nitrogen uh, needed in order to bracket um, all of our, our yields and protect against yield, but there's still lots of opportunity to reduce uh, the rate at these sites if we could um, figure out how to do that. So there's different tools that um, are available and have been promoted historically to help fine tune your nitrogen fertilizer application rate. Um, and so we have you know, nitrogen credits that we use in nutrient management planning for previous legumes in rotation or residual manure history or you know, cover crops that might increase the fall manure nitrogen availability factor, whether that's you know, valid or not. You know, I, I showed you some data that suggested maybe we're over crediting that. Um, but it's, these are tools, these are factors that are currently available. We also have uh, a soil test that you can do mid-season in corn right before you put your um, side dress out where you look at the soil nitrate level mid-season and then um, based on that nitrate level that's an indication of mineralization that's occurring and you can adjust your side dress rate. And so these are effective tools that have been calibrated typically in systems that um, have not had cover crops included in them. These tools were developed in the 1990s when cover cropping was kind of a, a niche thing. And cover crops really changed the dynamics of mineralization and nitrogen release. So um, we need to develop new tools that um, can help us predict the nitrogen mineralization. And so, for example, the, the PSNT test, you might take that test in, in mid-June, and that test under a fallow condition has been calibrated to predict the amount of mineralization that will occur uh, later in the, in the growing season but we haven't necessarily calibrated that test under a legume cover crop or a grass cover crop to really predict does the, does the nitrate level at this point in time really indicate what, how much mineralization will continue to occur. They have potential to be a good tool, but they're not calibrated for that quite yet. So that's some work that we, we still need to do. So this whole process of nitrogen release is, um, uh, occurs when cover crops are killed, whether that's through tillage as shown in this picture here or with a, an herbicide um, no-till and left to decompose on the soil surface. As microbes decompose this material, they're releasing nitrogen. And if we wanna understand to be able to how to predict that nitrogen mineralization and, and credit that in a fertilizer program, we need to understand a little bit about um, the nitrogen mineralization process and how to, um, you know, how that process works in order to be able to predict it. So this is a quick, I'm going to give a quick overview of how this process works. Um, so essentially we have some decomposing organic material on the left here that is composed of carbon and some amount of nitrogen. And we can refer to that ratio of carbon to nitrogen as the C to N ratio. Now what microbes are doing as they decompose this material is that they want to use um, that carbon to build their biomass but microbes aren't 100% efficient at building biomass um, out of this carbon. Some of that carbon is used as an energy source and released as CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, is, so there's some portion of this carbon that doesn't go into microbial biomass. Now, as the carbon is decomposed by the microbes, they're also decomposing this nitrogen. And some of that nitrogen that's decomposed from the residues is gonna be taken up by the microbes to build their biomass they have a C to N ratio. They need for every 10 parts of carbon in their biomass, they, they need one part nitrogen. So they're kind of, it's kind of like a, a recipe, right? To make a microbial biomass, take 10 parts carbon and one part nitrogen and you've got a microbe. So they're gonna use some of that nitrogen, but depending on how much nitrogen was in the residue, there might be some extra left behind. And that extra is what's going to uh, mineralize and become available for the next crop. So, depending on the C to N ratio, if we have a low C to N ratio residue uh, with lots of nitrogen, you'll get lots of mineralization. If you have uh, a high C to N ratio, which means a low amount of nitrogen, we might not even have enough to feed the microbes and the microbes might need to scavenge nitrogen from the soil and this arrow will go in the opposite direction and we get a tie up. So the neat thing about this process is that it can be turned into an equation that we could potentially use in a system to create a nitrogen credit um, for, for cover crops. 
So when we look at C to N ratios, this is an important component of the cover crop residue that regulates how much will um, mineralize and become available. A low C to N ratio means you have a high nitrogen concentration. A high C to N ratio means you have a low nitrogen concentration. And there's some range kind of between, you know, 16, 18, 20 to one, up to about 25 to 30 to one, where if you're below about, you know, 16 or so, you're gonna get some net mineralization and microbes will release excess nitrogen to the soil. The lower you are here, the more they'll release. If you're above about 25 or so, you're gonna have some tie up and immobilization. And sort of in the middle here, there's kind of a neutral effect where that residue as it decomposes, it's neither gonna release nitrogen nor it's gonna tie it up. It's just gonna be enough to feed the microbes, but it won't actually feed your crop any. So different cover crops fall into different ranges of um, this uh, C to N ratio. Legumes like clovers and peas tend to be very low and will mineralize lots of nitrogen. Radishes tend to be on the lower side. Other crops um, can range quite a bit depending on when they're killed. So the grasses like cereal rye, triticale, annual ryegrass, you can let them grow very mature and, and their C to N ratio will, will um, get higher and they might immobilize more, more nitrogen. Um, mixtures tend to be um, kind of uh, in this range where they're not really releasing a whole lot of nitrogen. Some, it depends a lot on how much, how many legumes you have in it. Um, so, you know, something that's something to consider is that mixtures are probably going to push you into this range where you're getting neutral uh, mineralization or maybe even some tie up depending on the, the composition of the mixture. So um, this is the data that I showed you from uh, the experiment where we looked at leaching all of the different cover crop mixtures. And we grew corn um, after these cover crops and that corn received the phosphorus balanced rate of dairy manure and no other nitrogen fertilizer. Um, so that phosphorus balanced rate of dairy manure isn't gonna be enough to meet the full nitrogen needs. And we're gonna be looking to these other cover crops to potentially supply some nitrogen. If we look at what the fallow yielded, we can see that um, clovers, radishes, and peas yielded slightly higher than the fallow because these cover crops released some nitrogen that was made available. Anything that yielded below the fallow, we potentially saw nitrogen immobilization occurring from those cover crop residues. So we see the C to N ratios of our, our clovers are 12 and 10, and um, our mixes that had rye in them tend to get uh, fairly high and they increase as we get more and more rye in the blend. So that's an important thing to be aware of is this potential for immobilization with um, rye monocultures or mixes that are heavy on the rye. So one of the tools that we're developing at Penn State to help refine uh, nitrogen fertilizer recommendations is a tool that will help us predict um, what the yield that will be achieved um, in a field based on nitrogen mineralized from soil organic matter or cover crop residues alone. And then we also look at what the yield goal is in that field based on a farmer's experience. And there's a certain yield gap there that needs to be covered by the addition of some amount of nitrogen fertilizer. And so if we can predict what this yield gap is, we could then predict the amount of nitrogen fertilizer needed to achieve that yield. So we've developed a tool that's based on the nitrogen mineralization equation I showed you earlier um, that will help adjust uh, what the yield is of, the, of an unfertilized corn crop based on different cover crops that might be grown. So for example, a rye cover crop might immobilize some nitrogen compared to no cover, or a legume might provide some nitrogen compared to no cover and, and ha you have a smaller yield gap. So there's less nitrogen fertilizer needed. And so, this also, the tool also works, takes into account the soil organic matter level. So a low soil organic matter, a medium or a high soil organic matter will change um, the height of the unfertilized corn yield and the yield gap that needs to be covered with nitrogen fertilizer. So this tool is um, currently available. It's, um, it's uh, an experimental tool. So we're doing a lot of on-farm research right now to try and validate this tool. And um, the 4R Alliance members are, are participating in this um, in, in the coming growing season. So we're really excited about that. Um, but the tool is currently available for um, experimentation. If you'd like to use it and, and learn about it, you can go to this website here and Katie will send out a follow-up email with this website as well.
But on the tool, um, if you click on web-based application under the available format, there'll be a little um, uh, input box here where you put in specific measurements about the field, so your yield goal. You need to measure the um, sand and clay content because those things regulate nitrogen mineralization. So this would be a soil texture analysis to get done at a lab. The soil organic matter level, um, cover crop nitrogen and C to N ratio. You plug all these things in, it will predict your unfertilized corn yield relative your, to your yield goal and give you a supplemental nitrogen fertilizer requirement to cover that gap. So this would be a way that you could adjust, say, what's the C to N ratio of the cover crop that I'm growing based on what you get from a lab test or from some you know, other estimate, we might be able to produce book values of what you know, a rye cover crop is at different growth stages that you could put in there. One of the key measurements though, is the amount of nitrogen in the cover crop biomass. And to help estimate that, we've developed a tool um, or developed a new use for an existing tool called the Green Seeker sensor. So this is a sensor that measures the um, greenness essentially of the cover crop canopy it gives you a number called the NDVI, which is Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which is a scale from zero to one. And the higher that NDVI value is, it means the greener your cover crop is. And that greenness comes from chlorophyll and that chlorophyll contains nitrogen. And so there's a really nice relationship between the NDVI value of the cover crop and the nitrogen content of the cover crop. So on that um, website that I just showed you on the previous slide, there's a, a little box that you can type in the NDVI value of the cover crop and the different cover crop species, and it will look up on this calibration curve what the nitrogen content of that cover crop is. So it's a, a handy tool that you could use in the springtime right before the cover crop is terminated to get an estimate on N uptake in that cover crop. These sensors also can be uh, mounted on a, a sprayer and um, actually map the cover crop greenness as you're spraying out the cover crop. So you, if you're um, already making a pass across that field, you may as well map your, your cover crop. Um, so there's a project that we've looked at over the last year to look at variable rate prescriptions based on mapping the cover crop at the time of termination. We're also mapping soil texture uh, based on electrical conductivity. This is a, an electromagnetic sensor that map soil texture, but you can also have Vera sensors that do that. We create maps of the cover crop biomass and how that varies, uh, the nitrogen content, how that varies across a field. So this is a, a farm in Franklin County. And you can see it ranges from 135 pounds of nitrogen to only 15 pounds of nitrogen based on the topography or maybe you know manure might've been applied a little bit unevenly in this field historically. You've got pockets of very high and very low uh, cover crop nitrogen that we can adjust around. This is what the field looked like when we mapped it. You can see the variability. You can see pockets of greenness and, and uh, lesser green based on variability of nitrogen in that cover crop biomass. A sensor like the Vera sensor or uh, an electromagnetic version of a, a Varus like a dual EM could give you a soil texture map that creates different texture zones that could go into a prescription um, based on the electrical conductivity. Um, you could then soil sample by zone for texture and soil organic matter. You could estimate corn yield potential by zone based on um, uh, yield monitor maps um, previously. And then the intersection of all of those uh, layers together gives you a variable rate prescription across that field, how you might need to change the fertilizer application based on changes in texture, yield potential, cover crop nitrogen, cover crop C to N ratio. So there's a lot of opportunities, um, uh, I think, for improving our management of nitrogen, um, both retaining it as well as figuring out how much to, is released and how much to credit it. So cover crops are an important tool, but we know how to need to know how to use them. You can't just be random and, and casual about this. You gotta be wise and, and educated uh, when you're using cover crops. Um, we saw that a seeding rate of 20% non legumes is, is sufficient to get most of the benefit and then um, this helps to prevent immobilization as well. Um, so if you're working with mixtures, if you have the opportunity to seed a mixture, you know, 20% non-legume seeding rate would give you all the benefits for, for leaching. Um, if you're planting a grass monoculture, we may need more nitrogen for that uh, monoculture um, uh, when we move to the following corn crop because of the preemptive competition, cleaning up that soil profile. Some of that cleanup that we've done there is taking away the nitrogen that would be available to our next corn crop. And if we're not getting a rapid release, we need to account for that in our fertilizer recommendation.
Currently, our nitrogen recommendations in Pennsylvania have a big safety factor built in. So I'd say if you're you know, managing with a nutrient management plan or following agronomy guide recommendations currently, you're probably putting on enough or more than enough nitrogen than you need. Um, so don't you know, increase your rates beyond that just because you're cover cropping. But I think in the future, the opportunity to, um, excuse me, that was my phone, the opportunity to reduce nitrogen applications, I think there's a real opportunity to do that um, but it depends on the cover crop that we're growing, the C to N ratio, organic matter levels, soil texture, all those different factors. So we're, you know, developing this tool and experimenting with it, and we hope that um, it will work well and, and become widely used. So um, I think that's all. Uh, there's about 10 minutes left. We could do some questions, but I do want to thank all the farmers that collaborated with us, um, grad students and technicians in my lab group, um, folks on the agronomy extension team and our, our uh, agronomy research farm, and um, agencies and, and partnerships uh, that have um, helped uh, advance this work. Um, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation with the grant to create the Pennsylvania Soil Health Coalition, uh, numerous grants from the USDA NEFA and several grants from Northeast SARE have all contributed to um, developing this, this body of work. So uh, we're lucky to have um, robust funding around cover crops and, and nutrient management uh, in our, our region. So Katie, I'll hand it back over to you to uh, moderate some questions here for the next um, 10 minutes or so. Great, thank you, Charlie. Um, looks like we have a few questions that have come in. So let me hang on, hang on. I lost my chat. Um, so the first question was from Carl Rohr. Um, he's interested in knowing what types of manures you were using in the field trials. Okay, yeah, so the field trial I showed there where we had the fall manure um, with and without cover crops, um, that was a typical dairy slurry, um, uh, kind of 8% eight solids, um, uh, you know, agitated, it hasn't been digested or separated, any, anything like that. So, you know, very um, traditional dairy, dairy manure slurry there. Yep. Okay. Um, hang on. I lost my chat again. Um, yeah, so we had we had some other questions come in. Uh, Kevin Brown asks, so have we done any C to N ratio studies on organic matter left behind after harvesting the rye or triticale? Basically, C to N ratio of the root mass and short stubble after harvest. Yeah, that's a great question. And when you harvest all the above ground biomass, you're taking away most of the nitrogen, most of the greenery that might potentially recycle and you're leaving behind a lot of the more mature um, parts of the plant, that stubble or the roots that tend to be higher in C to N ratio. And so that's a system or that's a, a management system where there's going to be potentially even more nitrogen immobilization. Um, we haven't done a, a tremendous amount of work with that, but um, a number of years ago, I did do a study where we compared cover crop mixtures to a cover to a monoculture of rye, and the farmer harvested all of those and just left behind stubble. And we found that actually the root systems left behind did continue to regulate nitrogen availability, and we saw um, a boost in nitrogen availability when we had a rye crimson clover. Uh, radish mix compared to when we just had a rye monoculture. So my hypothesis is that the root systems of the clover in that mixture um, provided uh, some additional nitrogen, it essentially reduced the C to N ratio of the root system and promoted more mineralization. So the root systems, I think, are an important component and you potentially will see some changes of whether you've got a uh, just a, a grass root system behind, left behind or some mix of grass and, and legume left behind? Yeah, good question. Yeah, and just a reminder, if anybody would like to raise their hand or to add on to any of those questions, feel free. Um, we can call on you as well. Um, we have another question that came in in regards to the conclusion slide, you said that the 20% 20, 20 non-legume is sufficient to reduce the nitrogen leaching. How many pounds per acre 
fear of non legging would that mean? And that's yeah, my that's, a, that's a great question. So when I say 20%, um, I'm always speaking, uh, I'm always referring to 20% of whatever a typical um, monoculture seeding rate would be of that grass. And so that varies depending on, on the species, whether that's rye or oats or annual rye grass. But let's say we're, um, you know, we're, we're rye and we're putting out um, two bushels of rye, 112 pounds per acre of rye seed would be our monoculture. Um, so 20% of that. So if you put out say 22, 23 pounds of, of cereal rye seed, that would be a 20% seeding rate. Now annual rye grass, we might only be putting out say 10 or 15 pounds of annual rye grass seed as a monoculture. So 20% of 10 or 15 pounds is gonna be say, you know, two to three pounds of annual ryegrass seed in a blend. So it all depends on what the monoculture seeding rate is of uh, an individual non-legume species. Okay. One more question that came in from Kevin Brown. So this is a good question. Um, are you saying now that we need to plant cover crops for scavenging? And then we're going to need to plan to apply more nitrogen the following year. So that means accounting for the cost of the cover crop plus the cost of more fertilizer. So um, that's not exactly what I'm saying. Um, it depends on what your nitrogen fertilizer rate was to begin with. And if you're uh, putting nitrogen fertilizer at rate using traditional recommendations of one pound nitrogen uh, per bushel of expected yield, that recommendation has a large safety factor built in um, for most scenarios. And there's a lot of opportunities to reduce even below that rate. So if, you're, if you've been managing with traditional recommendation system and then you add cover crops, you're still, that recommendation system has enough of a safety factor built in that I don't think you need to actually increase beyond what we're already recommending. Um, what I'm kind of seeing in my data is that the opportunity to reduce nitrogen fertilizer is still there, even with a cover crop. But um, when we grow the cover crop, we could probably reduce it um, even more if we didn't actually grow that rye cover crop. It's kind of sad, sad to have to say that, but that's what all the data is indicating. Um, and that's because of that strong preemptive competition effect. Now what that rye cover crop is gonna do over time though, it's gonna build your organic matter levels. And if you're using a recommendation system like we're experimenting with that takes into account organic matter, over time, you're gonna see that organic matter level build up and that's gonna offset some of your nitrogen fertilizer. So if you're not using cover crops and then you transition to using cover crops, there might be a, a, a couple of years where actually, yeah, you do need to increase the nitrogen fertilizer, but then what's gonna happen is those cover crops are gonna build your organic matter levels and then you can start backing off again. And so um, there is, I think we have to be aware of if we're transitioning to the use of cover crops, there may be a phase where um, we have to boost a little bit our, our nitrogen. Um, but I think still, I don't want anyone to walk away from this webinar thinking they need to use more than what the agronomy guide kind of currently recommends in terms of that one pound nitrogen per acre, because that already has a very large safety factor built in. So okay. Dean asked a question, um, yeah. do you see seasonal error in, I, NREX yeah. in your data with um, seasonal rainfall differences, wet season versus dry season? So this is something that our tool doesn't really take into account right now, um, but that potentially if there's excessive rainfall or dry soils where mineralization is slowed down, we've kind of calibrated this for average conditions. So if you're deviating from average in any given year, um, you may need to make adjustments. Um, it's always difficult to know during the growing season, at what point do you decide we've deviated, right? If you get crazy weather early in the season, it's easy to make a call that we've deviated, but sometimes we get crazy weather late in the season when we've already made our decisions and there's no going back. Um, so that, that's a challenge too. Yeah, so the question from Carl here about uh, 50 to 75 percent of carbon leaves the soil profile through respiration of CO2. And this is, yes, this is primarily due to microbial respiration. So as microbes are trying to gain energy from that carbon, they oxidize that carbon um, from sugars basically into CO2, the same way when we eat 
uh, our food, we oxidize that carbon in our stomachs to get energy. Um, microbes are doing the same thing. So we're breathing out carbon dioxide. Every breath we breathe out has CO2 in it. Um, microbes are, are doing the exact same thing. Yep. Okay. Well, great. Um, and if there's any additional questions, I well, hang on, something just popped up. Oh, okay. So if anybody has additional questions, you can reach out to Charlie following this webinar and send out contact information and some additional links and as well as a survey about this webinar. Um, and that'll be coming out within a couple of days here. And if you haven't already, please enter your um, name and your CCA or your nutrient management certification number in the chat box. We're gonna leave the chat box open for a few more minutes here um, for all of you to do that if you haven't done that already. And- Okay, I'm still here. So you can just put me back down again. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Yep, and um, we thank you all for participating and we hope that you can join us for our next webinar next week, same time, same place. We're gonna be at um, Wednesday, October 14th at 11 o'clock. And that will be Eric Rosenbaum speaking and he's gonna be sharing about some fertilizer management challenges and um, it should be a really good session. I forget what the exact title is. Eric, if you're on, feel free to say. But um, yeah, so we hope you can join us and we'll send out some information about that as well. And um, yeah, we, we just really appreciate you all taking the time out of, out of your schedules. And thank you so much to Charlie. Um, we really appreciate you sharing this knowledge with all of us. Great, it's, uh, it's been my pleasure. I'm, I'm glad that we've got such um, an interested audience in Pennsylvania that um, this work uh, is, is well received. So I'm very appreciative to work in the community um, that, that we're all a part of. So thank you very much. All right, thank you.